Most of evolution we can look in one of two ways, one of which being microevolution. The other macroevolution, which we will talk about later, but microevolution is looking at changes in traits within a population. So within a population, we can see traits ebb and flow this way or that over time. Even those who oppose the idea of evolution generally for religious reasons will often acknowledge that microevolution is occurring, but they may resist more the idea that species evolve or that new species will evolve over time. So the classic example of microevolution is the peppered moth, which inhabits uh, England. And the idea is during the Industrial Revolution, we saw a shift from black moths to uh, actually from white moths, which matched the bark of the trees there. That's where they would hide. And then during the Industrial Revolution, the soot gathered on these trees making them darker and so now the black moths were more represented in the population so we saw a shift shift a change in those traits over time what's interesting is after the industrial revolution so after measures to reduce pollution were in were in place and the trees turned white again the population then shifted back to a more peppered moth so the white moth was more abundant than the darker moth So to understand evolution, we have to understand these basic tenets, these basic observations. One is that members of a population vary in their inherited traits. So do we have a bunch of different traits, whether it be um, color or number of antenna or eyesight ability. If you think of a human population, there's a lot of variation. Same thing for other organisms. All species can produce more offspring than their environment can support and many fail to survive. So this was an observation made by Malthus and which was an important for understanding the first hypothesis formulated by Darwin about evolution. So from there we can infer that individuals who have traits that give them a higher probability of survival and reproduction in that environment will have more offspring represented than other individuals. And this unequal ability will lead to the accumulation of those favorable traits in the population over generations. And this then is the method by which evolution occurs. Now you do this over very long periods of time and that's how you get speciation. So some scientists will say, well, there's no micro or macro evolution. Everything is just this playing out over longer periods of time. So we can see and demonstrate microevolution in artificial selections, which is where humans will select for traits that they want. Um, the best example of this is dogs. Right, so wolves have variation. You can see some of them are black, some of them are white, some of them have this black and white and gray we have red wolves we have um different species of wolves um but even within a population within a pack you can see variation when we domesticated wolves however we created a lot more diversity in our traits that we are selecting for and if you look at dogs now and it's crazy to think that uh, a chihuahua, this little rat dog looking thing, um, had has the same genes, has the same genetic makeup, and could interbreed with a wild wolf. Those are the same species. They've just been treated differently and been put under different environmental conditions. So natural selection then, we've, we've said there are mechanisms in place by which the only few of a population will survive, and that depends on the environment. So the environment creates these conditions for survival and reproduction. It doesn't create them, right? There's no intention, but they are there. They do exist. Um, those traits that enhance survival and reproduction are represented in greater frequency over time, and this results in matching between populations and their environment. Sometimes we call this 
adaptations. So a, an organism is adapted, has traits which allow it to succeed in its environment. So one of them is this snake is able to unhinge its jaws so that it can eat prey that are larger than its head. That is an adaptation which has been, or a trait that has been selected over time, which gives it an advantage for survival and reproduction in its environment. So what if an environment changes or a population moves to a different environment? So we see this in the Galapagos Islands. There was a, a, a tortoise which got washed up onto an island. There was a pair or a small population of finches which were washed up onto these islands. Uh, and the islands have a different environment than the mainland. Well, natural selection, this new environment, will impose conditions which are different, which will then select for different traits. And so you will get variation in the organisms in there. They will not look like their ancestors because of the different environment and thus different selection pressures. This can lead to new species, but new species is macroevolution. So one of the misconceptions about evolution is that individuals evolve. And sometimes this word evolution is borrowed by other areas of our culture, including Pokemon, right? So it says that Pokemon evolved. In reality, animals don't evolve. So one individual does not become something different. It is through populations, through generations, through reproduction that evolution occurs. So make sure to critique anyone playing Pokemon Go on their phone that that's not really evolution. Put them in their place. So uh, the evolution of populations is microevolution. This is a change in allele frequency. So we've talked about traits before. More specifically, we're looking at the genes, the alleles, which control these traits, and those are going to change over time. And we can mathematically then calculate whether or not an allele is changing over populations. Uh, an allele is an inheritable trait or characteristic which is corresponded to a certain gene. So in this example here, we have population A and B. They have alleles which control the color of their plumage of these birds and uh, one population is different than the other. Population A has more homozygous, population B has, sorry, homozygous dominant, population B has more homo homozygous recessive, and m moving in and out of the area can change the allele frequency. Fitness is another important term to understand. I've said survival and reproduction a number of times. Uh, the term to represent that is fitness. So an organism's ability to survive and reproduce um, is called its fitness. Relative fitness is, well, let's look at an individual and compare it to something else. So if a, an individual has a trait which allows it to survive and reproduce um, greater than other individuals in the population, then it has a greater fitness, greater relative fitness. So this large goldfish um, may be able to live longer because it can acquire more resources um, it can produce more eggs or more sperm. It has a greater relative fitness. This tree here in this um, population of trees is larger, can gather more light, more resources, has a greater ability to reproduce, has greater fitness. All right, we can characterize then different types of natural selection by how the traits change over time. And three of those that we're going to talk about are directional selection, disruptive or diversifying selection, and stabilizing selections. So we'll talk about these individually. So first, directional selection is where the, the trait is shifting from one to another. And we can call these the extreme. So if it's on a bell curve that you see here, like this is a histogram or frequency of these different traits, um, our peppered moth is a great example of this. 
the wider moth was selected for, but the environment changed, and so the selection went towards a direction, towards the black moths, and then back to the white moths after um, less pollutants were put in the air. Disruptive or diversifying selection favors two extremes over the intermediate type. Uh, so, for example, these rabbits live among rocks that are black and white, uh, sorry, black or gray. And so um, this white rabbit is selected against the predators can find it more easily. The gray and the black ones are more camouflaged. And so you have then the two variants doing better than the original white population. Stabilizing selection then is selection against the extremes towards an intermediate uh, norm. Okay, so an example of this, robins lay four eggs. Um, if it lays more than that, it will be selected against, or less than that is selected against. Um, so more than that and the it's less likely that the eggs will be viable less than that mm, sorry more than that means they're unnourished less than that and you're going to get less viable offspring all right another factor which can affect fitness which can affect affect um traits in a population is sexual selection so how individuals males and females choose mates to reproduce this often leads to sexual dimorphism you see uh, sexual dimorphism is different physical appearances of the sexes so you see a bunch of them here a male peacock has these huge feathers uh, a female spider spider is usually much larger than a male here you have a male wood duck, much more ornamented than the female, it's just gray and drab. Um, also, this lizard has this large dewlap, is what it's called, this neck throat colored area for signaling for mates. There are two types we're going to talk about intrasexual selection and intersexual selection. So, intrasexual selection, intra means within. So, this is where within the sex, the choice or the competition is occurring. So potential mates compete directly for mating. Generally, it's the males. And this usually is uh, some sort of physical combat. Males fight for access to females. Uh, elephant seals will fight. Deer and other ungulates will fight with their antlers. Kangaroos will box. And the winner, whoever stays around the longest, can take the greatest beating, then gets access to the females for mating. Uh, intersexual selection inter means between so between the sexes so this is where one mate chooses another generally it's the female choosing the male but not always um, and it's usually based on an elaborate behavior or trait so here we have these house finches generally the males that are more brightly colored in plumage in their feathers uh, that have this dense rich redness or orangeness are the ones that mate uh, these birds of paradise on the left some of them have these very elaborate dances and coloring of their feathers which I'll, then the female will fly by and choose to mate with that male the good genes hypothesis is that the trait is usually a signal or associated with some sort of fitness indicator so the plumage on these house finches could be because of their diet is high in carotenoids so that means they're getting a high quality food so they're more red because they're better able to uh, acquire resources and then those genes for doing that would then be passed to the female's offspring sometimes sexual selection can result in very elaborate traits which we would then call runaway sexual selection so it may become so enhanced in um, a, a species that it creates this very elaborate um, trait so these birds of paradise in the top right have these amazing multicolored and weird feathers 
Um, or the flycatchers are a different type of bird that have this very, very large tail. Generally, it's um, balanced by natural selection. So at some point, that tail is going to be so large that it's going to disrupt an ability, the ability of the of the bird to fly, or that the coloration will be so bright that it then um, makes it more susceptible to predators. All right, so um, genetic variation is important to understanding evolution. We know these because we studied uh, these terms because we studied uh, genetics in Bio 1, but we view them here. So genotype is the genes of an individual or the alleles of an individual, usually represented by letters. And the phenotype is the physical expression or trait of the gene. Genes can be recessive, usually um, represented by a lowercase letter or dominant represented by an uppercase letter, a codominant where both of them would be capital letters. And some genes are plastic, meaning they aren't necessarily fixed in their expression. So an example of this is muscle mass in humans. So all of us have genes for muscles and that does have uh, an effect on how muscly we are, but we can also do things which can enhance our muscle structure. So we can work out, um, we can eat different foods, um, we can focus on exercises which will strengthen different parts of our body, and thus you can increase your muscle mass. So that would mean this trait has some genetic component, but also a environmental component as well. So there are some things which preserve genetic variation in a population to make sure that the whole population is not uniform in their traits. Um, these include gene flow and being diploid, uh, balancing selection, two types we're going to discuss here, heterozygote advantage and frequency dependent selection. So first, gene flow. This is what we described with those birds or also with these beetles, different populations have different makes makeups of traits and genes. And so if one or a few individuals migrate from one population to another, that's what we call gene flow. That's going to cause a change in the diversity of traits or the abundance of those traits. So if this brown beetle goes into the green beetle population, now you have some brown genes in the population. Um, eukaryotes are diploid and they represent uh, or they participate in sexual reproduction. So those genes are, are reshuffled in meiosis and fertilization. Recessive alleles are often hidden from expression and can remain recessive and carried in individuals. And perhaps as the environment changes, they be more advantageous later. So an example of that is a sickle cell anemia, which contains uh, some advantage in areas where malaria is present. Malaria and sickle cell anemia is also an example of heterozygote advantage. So if you are a heterozygote for sickle cell anemia, generally you don't show the trait, but you are also um, immune or show resistance towards malaria. So this causes the trait to remain in the population. and increases diversity in the alleles of that population. <laughs> Frequency dependent selection is where the traits in a population depend on how abundant those traits are in the population. So it's kind of confusing. Basically, the presence or absence or abundance of a trait will determine which traits are successful going forward. And a great example of this is side blotched lizard, lizards of the Northwest. There are three different color morphs in the males. The ones with yellow throats are smaller and they look like females. So they can actually go and hang out with females and then um, reproduce with them as what they would call sneaker males. The blue throats, what they do is they form strong pair bonds with the females and they 
um, just stay so close to that female that nothing else can mate with them. And then the orange throats are the biggest and the strongest, and they can outcompete then uh, the smaller individuals. So each of these is kind of like paper, rock, scissors. Each of these has a advantage over the other. The orange throats beat the blue because they're bigger and they can kick them off. The blue ones beat the yellow because they're so close to their female counterparts that the sneaker males can't come in and mate. And then the yellow one beats the orange ones because uh, they look like females and so they won't be driven off. And so if there are a lot of orange ones, that means the yellow ones will be successful in the next generation. If there's a lot of yellow ones, that means the blue ones will be successful in the next generation. So you have this interplay, constant changing, and this um, allows each of these traits to remain in the population. All right, so other forces of evolution, not by natural selection, can occur randomly. Genetic drift is what we call when alleles randomly change in a population, their frequency uh, randomly changes. And it's definitely more significant in small populations or island populations, where you just have a cluster of very few individuals. Um, again, it's random. There's no a directional selection for it. It's just we just grabbed a few and that new population is represented with different alleles. Generally it leads to a loss of genetic diversity and can then reduce the fitness of the new population and thus be harmful. All right the first one is the founder effect, the second one is bottleneck effect. The founder effect is when a small population inhabits a new area. Um, generally, we can think of this as an island separated from the rest. That smaller population, generally, just by chance, if there's only five of them and there's a hundred of them in the original population, will have a different makeup of genes than the original population. So in this example, the ladybugs, there's no yellow ones in the island population because they're just in the small amount that went to this island, they didn't have any yellow the bottleneck effect is similar. This is where a population is decreased to a very small amount. And just by random chance, those that are left probably have a different makeup than the original population. And so we see in this example, um, we have, let's see, dark red ones in the original population and we don't after they've been reduced to a small size. All right, some traits are adaptive and some are non-adaptive. If they are adaptive, that means they result in a better match between the organisms and their environment. This is natural selection. If they are non-adaptive, that means they were just random, that the new population that is there is just because of chance. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through all the individual different uh, mechanisms we talked about today. And in class, we will discuss whether they are adaptive or non-adaptive. Um, so homework for you, go through these different ones and discuss, all right, is this something that was just a random difference in the population in the makeup of um, alleles? Or is this something where you have an adaptive trait, something that matches the traits in the environment? All right, that's it. We're done.